Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Hey, Nisma, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. You are a very busy person, I imagine. So I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thanks for having me, Jody. <laughs> yeah. So I like to start off these conversations by asking you if you have a story about an early memory of how sound moved you. So maybe some kind of a story from your childhood about sound that you that really impressed you. Yeah. So I would say... When I was really young, I would find myself um, watching, you know, my kids' movies, as you do, and always, always, always being drawn to the music in them. And, you know, I mean, I I think that's not uncommon for kids, Um, but it felt different for me. It felt like... um, there's, I felt connected to it in a certain way, and, and it made me, you know, want to, I think it made me want to pursue music eventually, and those those foundational kind of memories. Um, I'm trying to think specifically if there was a movie or, or something that... Um, like a particular song yeah, or something I, that really... And yeah. I, I, there probably is, but um, I'd have to really rack my brain. Um, but I just, you know what I was, I was finding out that when I was a kid, it was records. Mm. Okay. So I don't know what you were listening to, like tapes, CDs. Mostly CDs. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So it wasn't quite that far. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. But I remember listening to Henry Mancini Mm. on the, on, on like vinyl and Barbra Streisand and some of the, um, oh, what was it? Uh, not Oklahoma. Maybe it was Oklahoma. Mm. I think there was like a like some some um, performances on stage mm-hmm. that were on record, you yeah. know, and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah such special so stuff. I, I don't know. You know, actually, yeah. as you're speaking, one thing came to mind. I was, for all intents and purposes, obsessed with the Pirates of the Caribbean series. Um, okay. I wasn't yeah. that young, though, when they came out. I was probably a preteen at that point. But mm-hmm. I do remember that music having um, quite the impact on me. And then through that, I actually also learned about, um, gosh, what's the term for um, making sound? Is it, f- it starts with an F. It's when you, you create the sound after the movie's been shot oh foley yes foley thank you yeah i learned about foley and that really um i thought that was just the coolest thing ever that it all wasn't really happening in the moment i was so impressed by the level of detail that Mm -hmm. foley artists really have to you know pay attention to in order to get every sound just right so uh yeah very cool yeah it's pretty amazing i think i i read that um uh, rain is sizzling bacon. Oh, interesting. That makes yeah. sense. Well, because when you're when you're actually trying to record a storm, mm-hmm. there's so much wind going on. You're not right. going to get much actual sound through right. that microphone. Yeah, right? like, it's not going to sound like we would expect a storm to sound. Right. right. So that's why they. That's why all the movie magic. Um, yeah. In fact. I, I had a podcast, inter, uh, not an interview, actually just a, a solo episode that I did on soundless props. Mm. So, um, and I first heard about it through ASMR because one of the ASM artists that I follow, she was working with the soundless props that she had bought from a special place online or something. And she was like, hey, this is cool. Okay, so this like paper bag doesn't quite sound like a regular paper bag. It's like like muted sound, you yeah. know, or this cellophane, it's like made of a specific stuff so that it doesn't crinkle and isn't as loud, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Because when you're on a movie set, 
you don't want these things to be interfering with the dialogue. Yeah. So they make specific props for use on movie sets, which is, I found that fascinating. <laughs> totally right. And I have heard the one about the bag. Um, and another one I saw on TikTok like forever ago was ice cream is really potatoes. And there's yeah. actually, there's this guy, I forget what his name is, but he makes ice cream sandwiches out of like, um, I forget what, I think it's like, basically confectionery sugar like you would make like an irish potato um and it's just like a bunch of like really like frosting so it doesn't melt you don't think about these things you know but obviously oh, yeah. if the ice cream melts you know it's gonna make a mess and so ruins it's cool. the shot yeah <laughs> yeah 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 it's really interesting yeah our whole food network like all of the food that we have in pictures and in advertising and yeah. stuff like that like <laughs> it's not food yeah <laughs> which is crazy you, you don't want to eat any of that <laughs> isn't that like false advertising you know i don't know I'd... <laughs> yeah i guess nobody well, really cares <laughs> yeah it's you know that's kind of a theme these days yeah. isn't it right <laughs> very true <laughs> i mean there's so much yeah. to care about i guess we have to pick our battles that is that is very true yeah there are a lot of battles to pick these days <laughs> yes. certainly you know with AI coming up and and all of the you know is this real thing right you know like uh people simulating themselves or you know cloning voices and making yeah. art out of stuff that people have already put online and learned and uh it's yeah just, yeah so in an age like this like what drew you I mean I, I mean this all happened probably before you decided to become a musician <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so so what drew you in the first place to music yeah I you know I think I just I, I remember writing songs as young as like gee I don't know eight maybe even younger I mean they were really bad but I just remember being drawn to that process and they're always bad in the beginning <laughs> they, I, you know what sometimes they're still bad <laughs> I think it's just part of the process. But um <laughs> but yeah, I think I just I found um I think I found an uh, an emotional release. Um and uh and I had a, I had quite a stressful childhood. Um and so I think music and writing songs was probably the only really safe release I had to express my emotions and for some reason it was considered acceptable um you know in my family so um you know I, I think I just kind of gravitated toward that more and more as I grew up yeah it's a I, I think I think when we're teens and there's a lot of emotion going on and a lot of things that um you know we take very hard um dealing with our emotions is hard it's yeah. difficult there's yeah. a lot going on there and yeah I agree I was songwriting I think I started when I was 11 mm. around then yeah um and I was playing piano by ear just a little bit yeah. I mean I I don't do a whole lot of that anymore mm -hmm. but it was definitely a way to deal with things yeah and there was you know there was stuff to deal with there's always stuff to deal right. with right but there is yeah so when you decided to make music your career, mm. how did that transition? I mean, so you're writing to get out your emotions in a tough situation at home. And then where did it go from there? Yeah, I actually decided that I, I wanted to pursue music professionally from a pretty young age. I was in, I think I was a freshman in high school and, um, it happened as a result of me going to a singer songwriter convention that they were holding um, in my town, which was actually um, kind of a an odd thing for my town to to put on. It's a, I grew up in a very very small touristy beach town uh, where not much happened, so for them to be putting this on was kind of a big deal, and and they gave us all the high school kids like free student passes and so I remember going and you know obviously I was like well, the youngest person in any room and I had no idea what I was doing but I showed up with my little you know CD 
you know, demos that I burned the night before and <laughs> when you could burn CDs um, and, you know, my little business cards. And I, and I, you know, I, I just fearlessly, as you do at 13, just went around and, and tried to, you know, be part of the cool kid crowd there. And I just wow, felt, 13. yeah, I was so young and I, and I, oh I honestly, goodness. yeah, it's crazy to think that I even like, I guess that's what naivete does for you, right? It kind of gives you like a fearlessness. So, yeah, but totally. yeah, yeah, I just went through, through the building and just talked to people and I don't know, I just, I felt so inspired and so, it felt so right for me. And uh, it was kind of at that moment that um, I realized you know, I wanted to, I wanted to pursue music in a more professional way. And from that moment on, you couldn't stop me. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> what was the reception like when you were going through that building at 13? I'm curious. <laughs> I think people just kind of were like, oh, hi, you know, uh, yeah. you know, Pat you on the head. Yeah, yeah. they were supportive. <laughs> they were nice. And, you know, they could tell I was a kid who had no idea what I was doing, but was obviously passionate about music. And, you know, um, I do remember one guy, though, telling me to make sure I went to college for something other than music. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, okay, I'll consider that. But he was really uh -huh. telling me, like, I don't know if you Hard have what it takes, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. or that, too. Um, but um, but I, I didn't follow his advice. I ended up going to school for music, <laughs> which I, I still am trying to figure out if that was a good or bad decision. <laughs> But um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a mixed, I guess, a mixed bag. Yeah, I think sometimes people say things that they think are going to inspire us, and mm. instead, instead, they make us mad. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and if they make us mad, it makes us want to do it more. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I am totally that way. I want to prove yeah. people wrong. Exactly. I am definitely like that. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that you were not uh, dissuaded from your your uh, way. Uh, I think that's a really good thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what was the transition then from being 13 in that situation? Like, how did you end up actually making a living at what you're doing? And and I gather now that you're working more in the sync licensing area. Yeah. I mean, I do. I do. A, I do a bit of I do a lot. So I'm not, and, and I, this is probably my personality also, but um so okay, let me answer the first question. So I think, you know, it was a very, very slow transition. Obviously, I had to go from 13 to, you know, finishing growing up and going to school. And, um, sure. you know, there were there were there were, um, you know, pit stops along the way. But um, I always, always, always knew that I that I was that I wanted to do music. And and I think it. So the second year after, uh, when I was in high school, the second year I went to that convention, I actually ended up getting my first sync placement as a result of doing a little talent show that they had. Um, it was very happenstance. Yeah, it was very so cool. So at 15? Yeah, I was, I think I was wow. even younger than that. I think I was still 13 because I was like a young oh, high schooler. Okay. So okay. uh, I was 13 or 14, something around there. And I, mm -hmm. I played this little song that I had written and a publisher who was there really liked it and said um, that he thought it would do really well in film and television. And so he offered to help me get it produced. And I went up to this cool studio and I, I ended up producing the song and uh, with one of the guys who now vocal produces for Selena Gomez. And this was oh, like wow. 15 okay. years ago. Right. But so it was well, just that's cool a way to get hooked. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was just like a really cool experience. And that, that song ended up, um, it, it's been placed on so, so much stuff to this day. I get royalty checks for that song. So that was kind of like the first taste of like, okay, I can actually do this, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and then, so that kind of just kind of went to the side in the background while I finished high school. And, and then when I went to college, you know, you have to do college. Um, I did go to school for music, but you do a lot besides music when you go to college for music, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and so, but you that, went to Berkeley, right? Yes, Is I went, yeah, in Boston, okay. yeah. 
Um, yeah. And it's a very rigorous program, so it, it was... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, very cool. They, but... were a, they were a sponsor of my songwriting website, oh, really? Muse's Muse, for many, many years. Oh, yeah, cool. That, that was around from 95 to 2016, actually. Oh, wow. Very so, cool. Yeah. Early adopter of the internet. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, but I mean, you know, you've probably seen this happen a million times, right? You do what you do for so long that you end up facilitating others rather than yeah. doing it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So that's what happened with me in songwriting. Yeah. And hopefully that will not happen to you. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I I love to to teach. I mean, I, I'm a, you know, teaching I would consider facilitation to coaching and that is part part of what I do right now um uh but yeah so what I was you know the point I was trying to make um well the piece of the story rather was that after right after I was I was about to finish college um I sync kind of sync licensing kind of came back around and um I was like oh yeah I did this thing when I was like 13 I should probably keep doing that. And so uh, I I just kind of went full on with it. And that was like seven years ago now. So that's been kind of uh, one of the main pieces of my of my income and and my creative pursuits. And like I said, I have a couple other things going on, but that's that's kind of the main focus. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you can just explain to the people or, you know, or the person who's listening what sync license is because i think maybe a lot of people don't really understand quite what yeah. you mean by that totally just want to yeah yeah make absolutely sure no yeah so it's it's pretty straightforward i mean the very very short version of it is the music that you hear in tv shows movies ads etc um and there's obviously a, a whole semi complicated process for how you go about getting your music in those opportunities and on those platforms. Um, and it involves a few people, uh, but that's really it. I mean, it's, it's, it's writing music for those opportunities. So you make a piece of music, you put it up on these directories, or you get it into the hands of someone who does this. Pretty much. And then what happens after that? Yeah. So, yeah, you... Like you're saying, you proactively write music um, for these opportunities based on a mm -hmm. you know set of criteria that generally work, and then you submit that music to uh, they're in the industry they're called music licensing agencies, um, uh, and then those agencies receive opportunities from music supervisors, who are the people in charge of sourcing the music for the you know TV show etc., and then hopefully they choose your song. And so the idea is that that process happens over and over again with your music. And so you end up, you know, earning income. And what's great about Sync is that you get paid twice. You get paid upfront for the initial use and license of your song. And then you get paid performance royalties, which I'm sure you know all about with, you know, voiceover yeah. work and all that. So yeah, <laughs> it helps. Yeah. yeah. Well, with voiceover work, it depends on if you're in SAG-AFTRA okay. or if you're in, in a if you're in a union, then yep. yes, you get royalties. If you're not, then you just get that upfront fee. Yeah. So, but that upfront fee, as you've already mentioned, is based on where it'll be used for how long, how many people will hear it, yep. that kind of thing. Yeah, right? totally. So, yeah. And the budget of the so, show. Yeah. And the budget, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm assuming that an indie production would pay a little less than a major film. You right. Know, obviously. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... What are you finding now? And I everyone asks me about this in relation to voiceover, but I'm curious what your thoughts are in the music area. What are your thoughts on AI now? Because mm. there are lots of people that are just I don't know if they're doing this for feature films, mm -hmm. but like indies and commercials and all of that kind of stuff a lot of the the sync is well some of it I believe is now going into the hands of AI created music, or mm -hmm. at least AI begin began music, right. you know, like inspired by AI, and then the musician takes it on, you know, right. Um, I'm just curious where your thoughts are on all of that. Is it something that musicians can use as a tool? Do you think it's replacing them in some aspects? Where are your thoughts here? 
Okay, so I, yes, I have some thoughts on the whole AI conversation. And I, I think like anything, it's a nuanced conversation. I think there's always going to be good and bad and people who use it well and people who use it maybe not so well. But I, I think overall, there's a couple different pieces to the conversation. The first is that we've been using AI in music forever already. You know, I don't know what you know about, you know, music well, production. A lot of the samples. Exactly. So you know, yeah. you know, the, there's there's samples and there's plugins, you know, that mm -hmm. are all AI based, you know, for the most part. So we have already been using artificial intelligence to improve our workflow, to increase our output, to provide inspiration, what have you. Um, so I think, you know, like anything, it's going to, it's, it's going to swing one way heavily and then we're going to overcorrect like we tend to do. And then it's going to land somewhere in the middle, like it usually does. Um, and that's in terms of, you know, the idea or the fear that most human work will be replaced by robots which there is something to say for that but like i said i think it's it generally happens slowly over time and and so that the economy can kind of absorb the impact little by little and people can figure out what they want to do and what they need to do over time um and then the other piece to that is just musically speaking i just don't think robots can ever really do what humans can do in terms of what they bring to the table from their human experience and, and I may be wrong you know I may there may very well be some extremely hyper intelligent robot that they're working on that we will not be able to decipher you know um from a real human being at some point but I think we're a really long way away from that and the current AI tools we have today I just don't think you're going to get the same level of context that a, a real human being can bring to the table well that's the end of this episode thanks for listening and if you like what you heard why not tell a friend about this podcast it's available in all the usual locations until next time <laughs>